All right, everybody, let's get ready to get started. Are we excited? Okay. I'm so thankful for the seven of you that are happy to be here. Um, so here's our purpose for tonight. We're here tonight because of what Jesus did for us almost 2,000 years ago. So everything that we do tonight, the songs, the fact that there's a huge cross right there, hopefully the way that the Lord uses the message is all to point us toward the fact that we'd be lost and gone without the cross and that we would be lost and gone with, without G what Jesus did for us. So what I want to ask you to do before we pray, if you'll go ahead and stand, and these guys are going to lead us to worship when we pray. Uh, if you feel comfortable doing this, I'm going to ask you to do this. Just hold your hands out in front of you as we pray. And the reason we do this is for two reasons. Number one is to say, God, tonight my heart is just surrendered to you, to hear your truth, to know you, to give what I have to you. The second reason is to say this, Lord, whatever your spirit wants to bring into this house tonight, I'm fully ready to receive it in my heart. That's what this is. So as we pray, if we'll just lift our hands and pray to the Lord. God, we thank you. God, we know that we'd be nowhere without you. God, we know that we'd be dead and gone without you. And Father, in this house, we are ready to receive the blessing that the Spirit wants to give us tonight. God, we are ready to surrender everything we have to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. God, everything about tonight has nothing to do with my ability Everything about tonight has nothing to do with the band's ability. God, everything about tonight has to do with your ability, with your ability to save, with your ability to defeat death, with your ability to have the victory. So, God, we receive it. God, right now we speak against distractions in this place tonight. God, we speak against everything the enemy is going to try to bring against us in this house tonight, and we do know and believe that everything is yours. We're open to you tonight, Jesus. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen. How are y'all doing tonight? Y'all don't sound too good. How are y'all doing? Good. All right. So this first song, it's called My Jesus. I'm sure y'all all know it. Um, and as Jacob was just saying, this is not about just getting up here and singing some songs and me getting y'all to sing with me. This is about worshiping the King of all kings and Jesus Christ who died to save our sins. So y'all sing with us and um, let's have some fun. Yeah. 
care that much about me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love strong. Father, open up my eyes. See you with him. So I might truly see everything that you've done for me. That's our prayer tonight. Open up our eyes. Lord, I'm tired and I'm torn. Faces on the floor. Break this chain and set me free. He says, Wash Lord, clean. Don't you know I want to be washed clean? Father, take away my pride. Set it all aside. So I'm not here to have to say. Lord, I'm tired of all my guilt. I'm tired of all. Break this chain and set me free. Lord, I want to be washed clean. Don't you know I want to be washed clean? Cause I've been living a life that I just couldn't see. Holding on to things I just didn't need. You took these hands.
says you baffle the wise frustrate the clever so everywhere we go everything we hear out in this world whether it's media whether it's stuff at school whatever science no matter what it is there's always a slant on it that is put there I feel like to turn you away from God's word no matter what you, you you're looking at if you're talking about how we got here what was was their creation, evolution, anything you look at, there's always a slant that makes us try to question God's word. But God's word is solid and true. And that's what that's what we as Christians have to stand on. That education doesn't make you wise. It makes you smart, but that's not necessarily godly wisdom. Experience it, it, can, it can lead you to making right decisions, but not always godly decisions. True godly wisdom comes from God's word. So as you think about God and his wisdom, I want you to think about this song as we sing it. You baffle the wise, you frustrate the clever, while foolish gospel preaching. That might sound a little weird, but God's word actually says that people are going to come to know him by the foolishness of preaching. So... Think about the wisdom of God and how we can grasp that as we sing this song. Sing those words again. Changes lives 
bears the burden where another died for me there is another in the fire oh there is another in the fire oh all my depth left for Devonese Father, thank you for allowing us to be here with you today, God, and thank you that there's always another in the fire, God, even when it doesn't look like it, and thank you that all these years ago on Good Friday, Lord, you gave us a reason to call this Good Friday, and thank you for carrying our cross and our sin so that we could have a way to live eternally with you, God, and if there's anybody in here today that doesn't know you and the promises that you've given us, Lord, please open yourself to them today and open their minds and their ears and their hearts to find you today, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be here, and thank you for 
three days from now when you rose again, God. In your name I pray. Amen. If I was more prepared, I wouldn't have sat on the opposite side of the sanctuary from the mic pack. But we are all good to go. I love that song, Only Wise God. Our students here at Murray Baptist know that song. Um, the same band came and led worship for us at our D Now back in the fall. And I love that that phrase from the end of Paul's letter to the Romans. He's the only wise God. The Bible tells us that everything comes through and for Jesus and glory and dominion is his forever. We know that and I love that we can just dive into God's word and see that. So what I want to do for tonight is we have um, two or three main passages and I hope that when we leave here tonight, we can have a better understanding of what Jesus did for us. That when we leave here tonight, we can just bask in the presence of God and in, in what he did 2,000 years ago for us on Calvary. And for the most part, we're going to use Paul's letter to the Ephesians to do that and to see that. Um, the scripture is going to be on the screen. If you do have your Bible with you or you want to grab one in front of you in the pews, you can do that. Um, I'm going to flip around a couple of times, but the main scripture is going to be on the screen. And we're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at what the basis of Good Friday is, the basis for everything that we believe. And then hopefully we can have a better understanding of how we can lay everything at the foot of the cross by the end of the night. Um, before we dive into that, I know we just have prayer. If we can pray again, that God's word would move in power like it says it will. Let's pray. Father, I cannot do this without you. I'm lost without you. I'm dead without you. I'm sinful without you. But God, Paul says that with you we can count everything else as loss. So God, I pray that I could be an adequate microphone, that I could just be a loudspeaker for your truth tonight and nothing more. That God, that the truth that is spoken tonight, if there's someone in this room that's understanding it for the first time, if there's someone in this room that's understanding it for the hundredth time and just needs to come back home, that your word would do exactly what it says, what you declare, and it is that it will not return to you void. We need you in here tonight, God. We need to grasp the seriousness and the understanding of what happened almost 2,000 years ago on two pieces of rough timber that defeated sin forever. Help us to really know that tonight, God. Pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so... We find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 1. This is Paul writing to the church at Ephesus. And this is what we see, starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, he predestined us for adoption 
to himself as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise, Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Again and again in this passage, Paul says to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. The only thing worth worshiping is anything with glory. Worship is literally returning glory back to the object that gives that glory. There's only one object, there's only one being, there's only one person in all of existence that has the glory worth reflecting back to him, and that's the Lord. So he's called us to know him, to be saved. He's called us to live the life that he's called us to, all so that we can use it for his glory. So what I just read is the basis for everything that we believe. If you, if you can't get this in a contract and sign your name to the bottom of it, you're not a believer. You can't be. God created us and God loves us. Hopefully you've been taught that as long as you've been in church. Rusty mentioned that earlier. Creation, the truth of where we come from, who loves us, that's our God. We also believe that God has always had a plan from eternity past to save us from the eternal death that results from our sin. How? By dying on the cross as the incarnate human Son of God and Son of Man, Jesus and that God wants to eternally live in us as the Holy Spirit until we can one day realize the promise of eternally living with Him. If you don't agree with that, if you don't say, yep, that's what I signed up for when I heard the gospel call on my life and I said, yes, Jesus, I'm responding to you. If you can't agree with these things, you responded to an emotion, you did not respond to the Holy Spirit. This is all that the cross teaches us. Now, everything that I just read... The world is going to tell us that it isn't true. And the world is going to tell us that it isn't possible. But thankfully, we know that it is true. We know that it is possible. Why? Because we have seen God. We have felt God. And as believers, his plan to save us has come to fruition in our lives. How amazing is that? How much does that make us just want to kind of have a praise break real quick? Get the band back up here. Everybody just lift their hands in the air that God... We've seen him. We know him. We feel him. And the reason that most of us are here tonight is because he saved us. And we just want to give it back to him. We don't need a science textbook to tell us that God is true. We don't need our favorite influencer or our favorite celebrity to tell us that God is true. Romans chapter 1 tells us that creation tells us that God is true. Romans chapter 1 also tells us that the Holy Spirit working in the power of the gospel tells us that God is true, and that is why we believe him. Not because we need something accomplished for us to believe, not because we have to measure the Bible against science, which science and history do prove scripture, by the way. But we don't need the secular world to accept our truth before we know the calling that God has on our lives. Paul tells us the same thing in Colossians 1 as he does in Ephesians 1. And I'll read that to you. It says, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. That's Jesus. And he, that's Jesus, is before all things. And in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be pre preeminent. He might be first, he might be foremost, he might be the one at the top. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. How amazing to think that the most violent act that in our language, the word excruciating did not actually exist until crucifixion existed. That with that comes peace. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. This tells us the same thing. It tells us that the king of all of existence, in whom everything is held together, died, listen, so he could hold you and me too. He is the sustainer of all of existence. And he had a plan from all of eternity just so he could sustain you too. That's a love like our world doesn't know. Tonight, most of us might be believers. Most of us might have done all of our daily devotions and our Bible study today. Most of us in here might be exactly where we need to be with the Lord. But there might be some of us in here that maybe you're dealing with something right now you've never told anybody else. You've been walking with the Lord for years. And you just need Him to remind you that you are held. I need it sometimes. You just need to be reminded that you are held, that you can be held, that someone sees you and knows you. And what God wants you to understand tonight is that is what the gospel is. The gospel is that you are seen. The gospel is that you are held. The gospel is that you are known, that he has always known you. And his plan was so you could know him. That's what we understand Romans 5, 6 through 8 says this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You know how you're known? You know how you're seen? Because God made you knowing you would act against him. And God died for you in your place knowing that you were acting against him. And some of us tonight just need to know that that kind of forgiveness exists. That it's out there. In verse 8, God says that God shows his love for us. Not that God showed his love, which proves again scripture is working. Which proves again that scripture is alive. Which proves again that scripture is working around this universe. That God is still showing people again and again and again that his sacrifice still has power. That his sacrifice works. Today is the day of salvation. Not yesterday. Today. Somewhere across this world today, God is calling somebody to life. Whether that's in this room, whether that's in the remotest part of Thailand, maybe that's somewhere in the remotest jungle of Africa, God is still bringing dead people to life today. And he still shows that by belief in his gospel. At the perfect right time in all of eternity, Jesus gave his life so that we could have freedom in ours. And now the funny thing is, a lot of times for believers, much less the rest of the world, this can be hard to believe. 
Maybe we've been walking with Jesus for 40 years. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for two years. Maybe you're in here tonight and you've never actually been saved. You've never said, yes, Jesus, I know that you're calling me to salvation. Yes, Jesus, I know that my sin is why you had to die and I believe that you love me. And I believe you want to give me life. And I want to walk in that. For all of us, it just doesn't make sense. The gospel is so easy and it's so simple that that is why many people will never walk in it. It doesn't make sense to us because God's love defies everything we know about human logic. We didn't work to earn his sacrifice before he died to save us. Our world, the humanity, the sinful flesh that we live in, we basically live in a world where we have to do something to gain the favor of other people. And that's why the gospel of Jesus does not make sense. Because we didn't work to gain his favor. We didn't work so that he would die for us. None of us in this room were alive when Jesus died. None of us had to do things before Jesus died, which shows that God must have known us before the foundation of the world, the way that Scripture says, and he must have died knowing that his sacrifice was going to have to be enough for us before we could ever do anything. We may even have Christians in here tonight that may need to understand this, but His love for you and His love for me is actually unconditional for His people and flows directly from His heart of goodness and not from our deeds. Some of us just need to stop trying so hard and know that we are called, know that we are chosen, know that we are loved, And the cross is the proof of that. Adults as well as students need to understand this. That in a world where we feel like we have to try so hard to get others approval, we have to try so hard for people to love us, we have to try so hard to get others to accept us, there is one place where we do not have to strive to belong, and there is one place that we can trust the call to just come home. Unconditionally, just come home. Believe and come home. And that's the cross. That's why we have Good Friday. That's why it exists. That's why I'm up here right now. It's because I believe with all of my life that there is only one place, and it's the one place that I could never deserve to be. But it exists for me. And at 10 years old, I heard the call to just come home, and I did it. And that's at the foot of the cross. Sometimes we need to be reminded, believers, that the good news is still good news. That the good news is not still to be taken for granted. That the good news is still worth giving our life for. That the good news is still worth just giving a shout in church that Jesus died and he's alive. Romans 8.1 tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. That means that every heart... Every believer, every person that has stepped into the promise of freedom that Jesus gives is set free from condemnation of sin, set free from the condemnation of death, set free from fear, and we have life. We're free from all of it. That doesn't mean that we don't still encounter it. That doesn't mean that we can't still put it on ourselves. But that means that we are free. We're free. That means that the things that you allow to hold you down and the things that you allow to hold you back, in Jesus' name, they don't have to. Right now, whatever you have in your life, in Jesus' name, it does not have to hold you back. I don't think y'all are as excited as I am. whether you're a believer in here or not tonight. What God wants us to understand is that we may have walked in that door with some kind of shame in our lives, but in Jesus' name, we do not have to walk back out with it. 
you may have come in with a load. You may have come in with the world on your shoulders. But the six hours that Jesus spent on the cross and the two days that he spent in the tomb and what the women at the tomb saw when they went back and what the disciples saw at the tomb when they went back on Sunday tells me that I do not have to bear it anymore and that there is a place that I can lay it. I've been in the ministry for, this is my seventh year. A lot of you in here have been in the ministry for much longer. That doesn't mean that I don't feel shame. That doesn't mean that sometimes I'm not reminded of the wrong that I've done. That doesn't mean that all the things sometimes when I'm just alone and by myself, and I know somebody in here can relate to this, that I don't just feel it. And I just despise what I've done. And I despise myself. But in Jesus' name, it does not have to be that way. In Jesus' name, it does not have to be that way. 1 Peter 2.10 says, Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We were lost Humanity was lost with no hope, but then a faithful father stepped in. I don't know who in here struggles with a father situation, but I've got to let you know that there's one faithful father. There's one who doesn't leave you. There's one who knows what you're going through. There's one who loves you. There's one who holds you. And you have nothing. What other... What other man in this world you're trying to strive for his attention what other adult in this life even adults who look up to someone older than them this person that you are striving for they will never be the person that will hold you the way that jesus does once you were not a people but now you are god's people once i was nobody and i'm not just a somebody i'm not just somebody who's working his way back to life i was once nobody but now i'm a child of the king. Now I'm a child of the one and only God. And the same is true for every person in this room who has stepped up to life. The good news is if you haven't done that, it's waiting for you. Once I had nobody, nothing that called me to belong to it, no one who accepted me, no one who loved me, but now I am a part of God's people. So this is what we understand. I hope, at least at this point, we understand that Jesus had to come, that there was always a plan, that at the perfect time in history, Scripture tells us that more than once, that at the right time, one time that worked, Jesus died for all sin. And what I want us to understand is because sometimes we can kind of distance ourselves. Jesus didn't just die for your case. Jesus died in your place. Don't get that backwards. I love our military. And our military, I'm so thankful that we have people that are willing to go out and protect the freedoms of this country. But our military, our law enforcement, things like that, just to give you an illustration, they put their lives on the line for our case. In some cases, it could get worse than it is in our place. But they're fighting for us, for our freedoms, for our lives, so that if the case were to happen where our lives could be taken, so that we could be in danger, that issue is taken out of the way. Jesus' death is like you had no choice. You were born with a backpack. You were born with boots, you were born with a weapon, and you were just thrown out, and you are going to die. Jesus just didn't fight for us in case we would have to. Jesus died because without him we would be dead. He is in our place. We would be on the cross. We would be eternally separated, and we have to get that straight because believers don't get that straight. Believers don't understand that. We get it backwards, and it's why we take Jesus for granted. So we have to understand that. So now we look at chapter 2 of Ephesians. 
the first three verses first, and it says this. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, that's the enemy, that's the devil, that's Satan, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Don't miss that. Here's why the cross is important, because we were dead. I've already said it a few times tonight, I'll say it for the rest of my life. We are dead. We have to understand that about the gospel, why it's necessary. It's not like Jesus died just in case. It's not like his, de his death was because he wanted to do something just to kind of show he kind of liked humanity a little bit. It's because we are dead. And every person in this room that has not been brought back to life by Jesus is dead. At this moment, you are eternally separated from God. The Holy Spirit does not abide inside of you, in your heart. Your heart has not been changed. And if you were to drop dead right this second, you would be eternally separated from God in hell. It's not fun. But I want to explicitly say that so there is no question that tonight you know there's a way out. And I just pray right now that the Holy Spirit would work so that we would know that every heart would be convicted of where it stands. So why are we dead without Jesus? Some of us kind of like to act dead with Jesus. Y'all see how y'all act on social media? Right? What I refer to as everybody's favorite traffic hand signal. Right? Some of us don't always act alive with Jesus. But how do we know that we're dead without him? Because we do dead things and they kill us. If you're saved in here tonight, and what I say convicts you, do not hesitate to drop to a knee tonight before you leave this house and say, God, get me straight. If you realize that this is you, that you are doing dead things in your life and they are killing you, and you know that you have never sincerely responded to the gospel and said, Jesus, I need you to save me and be Lord of my life, then do not leave here tonight. Do not leave this house until you drop to a knee and just say, God, I need you to fix me and change me. We tear others down by how we gossip and by how we talk about other people to make ourselves feel better, and it kills us. We lash out in anger when the smallest thing is done to us. Whether we lash out to other, that person that hurt us, we lash out and vent to other people, we lash out on social media, we lash out in a big group gossipy phone call. However we do it, we lash out in anger when the smallest thing is done against us or we don't forgive because we have to protect the little bit of self-worth that we've taught ourselves that we deserve and no one is ever going to treat us that way. And it kills us. Maybe that's you. Maybe you know somebody like that. But we act that way and it kills us. We get drunk as much as we can. We get high as much as we can because it allows us to numb ourselves and forget what we feel. Just an escape for a moment and it kills us. We have sex with whoever we allow to use our bodies for that moment because we just need to be wanted. And it kills us. It kills us. So you want to know how to feel better about yourself? You want to know where to find your self-worth? You want to know how to lay your pain down? You want to know how you're wanted? Stop doing dead things and step into the light. Stop doing dead things and step into the light. I believe it could be possible in this room right now, but I believe it is somewhere across this globe tonight that right now in this moment, Jesus is calling dead people to come to life. 
in this moment, in these minutes that we have together, whether it's going to happen in this room and Holy Spirit, I pray that it does, or rather somebody in some country we never think about that's having to hide out in a basement to have church right now, Jesus is calling people to life. Don't lay your head down at night. Just because you think you've gone a full day without seeing a full move of God and don't take for granted that somewhere across this universe, Jesus is calling people to life. That just because you didn't get saved today doesn't mean that somebody is not being brought to new life today. Stop taking the work of God for granted in your life. Stop ignoring the work of God in your life. Today is the day of salvation, Scripture says. Today, right now. It may feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but I want us to understand this. Today, right now, the invisible God is working on this planet. Don't lose the majesty of that. Don't lose the grace of that. Don't lose the joy that God, most of humanity is a huge letdown to you. But you are still gracious enough that you are moving on our planet. Right now, somewhere, God, your Holy Spirit is changing lives. Just think about that. If you ever get to whatever that place is for you, maybe it's the beach. Maybe it's in the morning in a mountain cabin and the birds are singing. Maybe you have a house out in the middle of the field and you can't hear traffic. Whatever it is, when you get to your quietest moment, just sit and be still and believe that God is working, that God is still holding everything together. How do we know it? Because of the cross. If God is not the sustainer of everything, if God is not the creator of everything, if God didn't hold sway over all of existence, the cross never would have happened and the cross wouldn't matter. So I'm just going to encourage you tonight, before you go to bed, if you want to find a room in this church before you leave here, to just be still and say, God, I still believe. That the way you worked on the cross, you're still doing it today. That the day that you saved me, you are still doing that today. That even when the earth was without form and void at the beginning of creation, that the Spirit of God was still hovering over all of existence. When we get older and we've been walking with the Lord a long time, that can be easy to take for granted. And I know with our students here, it can be easy that our lives get so busy, we're still young, we're not all about doing everything the adults do in church. Students, I want us to understand, I want us to believe and to trust that this God that is bigger than you, this God that you don't think you have to take seriously, He is moving and working. He is real. He exists. He created you. And everything about this glorious, beautiful God is why you have breath right now. Everyone in this room, do not close your eyes and fall into deep sleep tonight until you're just still and you know He's calling dead people to life, that He's healing, that He's restoring, that even if I'm not seeing it, even somewhere on the other side of the world, when the sun is up, when my sun is down, that there is a celebration going on somewhere. Why? Because of the reason we're here tonight. So how can we rejoice about coming out of these dead things? Verse 4. But God, but God, I was dead, but God. I was lost, but God. I didn't know what a father was, but God. I didn't feel like I had belonging, but God. I thought no one loved me, but God. I thought everyone hated me, but God. The enemy had let me know that I was dead, that I was gone, that I was forever in the grave, and nothing good would ever happen in my life, ever. Maybe you're in this room and you've thought about ending your own life before. 
but God. But God, being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Even if I was lying and I was dead, even when I was gossiping and I was dead, even when I was stealing and I was dead, even when I wasn't respecting the place that sex has in life and I was dead, even when I was acting like God's name didn't exist, like he didn't have power, like he didn't come to die for me, he still died and I was dead and he made me alive when I didn't deserve it. By grace, you've been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It's so easy in this world to just feel like no one's kind, no one's considerate, no one loves us, nobody knows how to just be decent anymore. And yet, while we were dead because of God's immeasurable riches of grace, His kindness brought us to life. His good heart brought us to life. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Because of God's grace and mercy, and that alone and nothing we've ever done, because of God's grace and His love and His mercy, we have been made alive We have been set free. We have an eternal destination called heaven, not because of anything we could ever accomplish, but all because of the beautiful faith that God gives us to trust him. That alone. Don't take for granted tonight that you are saved, that you forget just how powerful the grace of Jesus is and that it has made us alive When you begin to truly walk in that faith, everyone here, if you've already been saved, you've had this happen. Maybe tonight's your night. Maybe you believe that God is calling you to life and this is going to happen for you. You can believe what verse 10 says, that you are the workmanship of God, that you are a masterpiece designed to walk in the light and life that he made just uniquely for you because he knows your name and your steps are ordered. And when you were still in your mother's womb, he knew the innermost parts of everything about you. That's how he knew to die for you, because he knows you, because he loves you. The purpose of God's grace, the characteristic of his love that gives us everything we need and eternally more than we could ever deserve is not to be kind to us because we deserve it. The purpose of God's grace is so that we could grow closer and closer to him and to lead us closer and closer to our purpose. If you're in here tonight and maybe you've been able to relate to me saying you feel like You don't know what you're doing on earth. You feel like you're not loved. You feel like you don't know what a father is. I've come to tell you that you have a purpose. You're not just here. You're not just a creation. You're not just an accident. You have a purpose. You have a father that has made you for a goal and a purpose in your life. You are an important piece of humanity that was made specifically for communion with the Creator. Made specifically so that we would value what a close walk with Him is like. I want everybody to understand tonight that your life has a goal. Your life has a purpose. Your life has a job. And that is to know that God loves you, to love Him and to know Him, And to help those around you love him too. 
That's the purpose of our lives. Some people make it even more simple, and they say we have two goals. That's to know God and to make Him, go, make him known. And if we do really know Him, if we do really value Him, then what a joy and what an honor it is that we fulfill the other purpose, which is to make sure the world knows Him too. To make sure the world knows that they're loved, that they're made for a purpose. You are not in charge of your destiny. It's not up to you. Fate is not up to you. Fate is not in control. You are not in charge. Whatever this inanimate universe decides is not in charge. What the Holy Spirit is calling you to do is to believe and trust and walk in the destiny that God has for you, which is to believe that He has a better plan for you than you could ever dream for yourself and to trust Him. I know I had a dream for myself that didn't involve the ministry. I had a dream for myself graduating high school and going into college and getting married that did not involve, I'm going to be standing here leading a Good Friday service, but God's plans are so much better. God's plans are so much more beautiful. And I just need somebody out here. The Holy Spirit just needs somebody to believe that. Maybe it's the youngest student here. Maybe it's the oldest adult here. Maybe somebody in between. That God just has a calling. Wherever, however you feel lost in life, God has a purpose to lead you to a better dream and a plan than you could ever have. And He just wants you to trust that and to believe that there's a purpose. So how do we know everything that we talked about tonight is true? How do we know we can believe it? How do we know we have freedom? How do we know that we were created for a purpose and that there's a purpose for our lives that is intended to affect eternity and history forever? How do we know that? How can we believe that? How am I not just a crazy guy shouting at you tonight? Because 2,000 years ago, The holy, perfect one displayed on a cross that he was willing to lay his life down for a sinful person like me who lied, who acted like he didn't know the name of Jesus, who disrespected his parents, who was dead and ready for the grave, who should have died. But 2,000 years ago, the only person that could never deserve it died me. That's how I know it. And the holy perfect one died for you. And that's how we can know it. And not only did he display all the proof that he was willing to lay his life down, but two days later, he proved that he holds the keys to life and death. And something that we can trust in tonight is that if Jesus is not still thinking about death, and if all of humanity was laid on Jesus and he was condemned, and he's not still thinking about it, holding him back, then praise Jesus, I don't have to think about it either. And what would just bring me the most joy tonight would be if somebody in here trusted and believed that the things that are holding you back from Jesus in his name, they do not have to. That he holds the keys to everything that you let hold you back. All of your shame, all of your condemnation, he's got it. And if he was killed in our place and he rose back to life and he's not thinking about those things, you don't have to. I need you to understand that tonight. And there could be someone in here who's been walking for Jesus for years and you just need to hear that again. That you don't have to wear that. That that doesn't have to be on your shoulders. Maybe it's someone who's watching online or somebody that's going to see this recording later that just needs to understand that those things are not meant to hold us back. Those things are meant to help us understand that Jesus can take care of every single one. In the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus was being arrested in the garden, when Judas 
and the captains of the guard and the officers and the soldiers all came to arrest Jesus. He conceded to those arresting him. He told them, you're right. This is your hour and this is the power of darkness. John Piper said this about Jesus' words. I love that statement. You hear the sovereign limitations being put on darkness. It's like Jesus is saying, you don't get a century, you don't get a decade, you don't get a month, you don't get a week, you get an hour. Jesus declared the boundaries of shame and everything else that puts us back. Jesus told darkness, you get an hour. My God, indeed, I myself set the bounds of this hour, and I will tell you that it's over Sunday morning. So you get an hour, and here I am to do what I came to do. So darkness, go ahead, do what you can do. Then Sunday morning, I'm coming out. I will break the chains of death. I will dispel the darkness. I will nullify the power of Satan. And my redeeming work will be finished. That means that there is something you have not even dealt with before that God has already beat it. Are we willing to believe that and trust that? My redeeming work will be finished. All the sins of my people will be paid for. All of my Father's wrath against His elect will be removed, will be satisfied. All of the judgment and condemnation that rests upon my church will be passed. And a flawless, gorgeous robe of righteousness will be completed by Sunday morning. Jesus said, okay, darkness... Okay, death. Okay, evil. Okay, sin. Okay, shame. You get an hour. You get three days to think you're the one in charge. But on Sunday morning, I'm bringing life to my people. You are past. Some of you are being held back by it. Right now in this moment, you can think about what in your past has been haunting you. Your failures, some of you are being haunted by that. Your mistakes, some of you are being haunted by that. Your shame, your loss, some of you are being haunted by these things. But what we have to understand is that they do not get the final say in our lives. God does. That sin does not get the final word in our lives. The cross does. That death does not get the final say in our lives. The resurrected king does. So you may feel, and I want everybody to just think and reflect and tune into the Spirit right now in this moment. Because you may feel like you've been dealing with it for a decade. You may feel like you've been going through it for a week, for a month, for a century. But hear me. Jesus says its hour is up. Jesus says its hour in your life, in his church, in his believers, in our families, its hour is up. It's dead. It's defeated. That's what Jesus is calling us to understand tonight. 
And he's calling for you to believe that your pain and your shame are dead, done, gone, and finished. And to trust that whether you believed in him years ago or you're believing in him right now, that he really is all in all. He's the victor. He's the lover of our souls. Maybe you've had a loss this past year. My wife and I can relate to that. Maybe it was a family member. Maybe it was a job. Maybe just relationships with family were cut. Maybe you've lost friendships. And the loss of everything is so deafening and it crowds out everything else. Jesus is saying that that reign in your life is over. Its hour is up. And so I want to invite you to close your eyes. And Holy Spirit, I speak against the power of distraction in this place. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. I'm not going to do the awkward thing asking you to stand up. Maybe you're in this place and you've been saved a long time and maybe you feel like the power of God is, is inviting you to be saved right now. Maybe there's some kind of loss in your life that needs to be reconciled. Maybe there are relationships that need to be healed. Maybe you just want to know that you're held and that God is real in your life again. Maybe you need to be reminded that the cross still works, that the empty grave that we're going to celebrate in two days still works. Maybe you're in here and you're struggling with things at home. Maybe you're in here right now and you just don't know how your family is going to make ends meet. Maybe you're in here right now Maybe it's somebody in the band. Maybe it's one of the guys back in the sound booth. And we just need to take a moment that we say, God, make yourself real to me again. God, save me. God, show me that I have a friend in you. God, show me that I have a father in you. So what I'm going to say is this. With everybody's eyes still closed, just thinking, reflecting on yourself, I'm not going to ask you to respond. I'm just going to say this. If there is something that you need to return, if there's something that you need to give back to the darkness, back to evil, back to death, and say it has no place in my life because Jesus is in charge, I invite you to step to a different place of the sanctuary. I invite you to come over to the cross. I invite you to step to one of the classrooms across our lobby. I invite you to come to the altar. And say, God, everything, I just give it to you. Maybe you're in here tonight and just for the first time, the gospel is real. That God has made you, that God loves you. Maybe you're an adult who's been in church your whole life and it's actually real and you know it from the Holy Spirit right now for the first time. Maybe you're one of the students in here who needs to take another student or adult you trust, take your student leader And just say, I need to know about Jesus. So God, I do ask you to do that work. Holy Spirit, I do ask you to move in this place. Holy Spirit, I do pray that you give us the wisdom and the knowledge to know that your sacrifice is real, that your existence is real, that your love is real, that you've saved us. And that in the powerful name of Jesus, there is not one thing that can keep us from your presence, from your love. God, I pray that if there's someone in this room that you just have to break down tonight, that you would do it. I'm going to ask that you would just take a second. The band is going to play a song. 
to give us time to just reflect and just to pray. If you need to do that, we're going to close out with another worship song, but we will stay worshiping and praying and getting right with Jesus all night if that's what it takes. So stay seated as long as you need to pray, as long as you need to get right with Jesus. They're going to play a song that we don't have the lyrics up for, and then we will just come together and worship one more time. Let's use this time to reflect. Thank you, Jacob. Every word he said was so true. Um, man, w- one thing about this song that we're going to sing, one day every one of us, every person that's ever been created is going to do a very... Um, scary terrifying thing but then at the same time it's going to be a wonderful great thing we're going to be face to face with jesus himself we've heard of all of the stories we've read about all the things that jesus has done one day we're going to be face to face with him and it could be the most terrifying thing that you'll ever face or it could be the most overwhelming joyful thing you've ever faced no matter if you believe it or not Every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that he's Lord. I hope it's going to be a great, great, marvelous thing for you to see him face to face. So as Spence sings this song, just think about when you're going to be able to stand before him face to face. And the only reason we can do that is because what he's done on Sunday 2,000 years ago when he came out of the tomb. Sing the song, Spence.
This next song that we're going to sing is called Goodness of God. So y'all stand and sing it with us. sing that chorus one more time. Let's just sing it a cappella, Spence. All my life. Sing it out. And all my life you have been faithful. Sing it to him. This is our prayer. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am. I will sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. Say that one more time. I will sing. I will sing of the goodness of God. Amen. Can we say thank you to the Baker Baptist Praise Man for tonight? 
Amen. Uh, we had one other student group uh, come tonight, student group for Baker. David, thank you for bringing everybody. Um, there's a few other people from other churches here tonight as well. Um, please know that if you need a home, a home away from home, we want to be that for you here at Murray Baptist. We want to love you, come alongside you. Anybody here, if you ever need anything from me, uh, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, Katen, I told you I wasn't going to call you up, but I am. Um, I called her up at the end of last year and said, oh my gosh, I couldn't do anything without her, and that's true. Um, I'm just going to ask you if you will, well, thank you for coming up because I told you I wouldn't. Um, if you will just pray over everybody's hearts after tonight as we go into Easter weekend and just um, thank the Lord for the service. Thank you, God, for this opportunity. I don't know if it's on, but yeah, I'll but... Thank you for tonight, Lord. Thank you, God, for what you did for us on the cross. Yeah. And God, thank you that tomorrow, Lord, we don't have to lose hope like the world, Lord. We can wait expecting, God, we can wait with hope, Lord, whatever anybody in here may be going through, Lord, that with you, God, in the wait, we can worship, yes. and we can have that hope. So, God, we just thank you for that. We thank you that Sunday's coming, Lord, yes. and that we know that you win, God, that you win in the end, yes. Lord. Just thank you for what you've done in my life, God, and I just pray, Lord, that um, that would be evident, God. I just pray over everybody that was able to come tonight, Lord, that you would bless them and their families, yes. God, that you would watch them as they go from here, Lord, and that if they don't know you, Lord, that they would realize, God, that you are calling them, that you love them, yes. that you want um, to be that for them, Lord, that you are just there, God. And I just pray, Lord, that um, as we go the rest of this weekend, God, that we would just be intentional in our thinking and our mindset of just how how this is the cornerstone of our faith, God. What we believe is what we're celebrating this week, God, and that we could carry that out um, daily when we have you in our lives. Lord, we love you. I thank you um, once again for tonight and just the reminder of the cross, God. And God, you did pay it all. And Lord, just help us to leave it there with you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.